Good. All right. So, good morning and welcome everyone to this year's uh, introduction course on computer graphics. My name is Wolfgang Hurst. I'm the, well, instructor of this course, obviously. So, uh, before we start with the actual course, uh, first some uh, introductional, uh, some organizational com uh, comments. Like I said, I'm already introduced myself. I'm Wolfgang Hurst. This is the uh, contact information where you can contact me or, of course, for, uh, directly after the lecture. Um, so first organizational comment, you already realized that this course or the lectures of the course are given in English. Um, also, the tutorial exercise that you get and the programming assignments will be written in English, but the teaching assistants all speak Dutch. I understand Dutch reasonably well, so you're welcome to talk or write Dutch to me. It might take a little longer when I... It's not working. It might take a little longer. Can you still hear me? Good. It might take a little longer when I uh, to process your question when you ask me in Dutch, but you're very welcome to try it. Um, and the exams will also be written in English, but you can answer in Dutch. So at any point during the course, if you have a, think you have problems following it because it is in English, please let me know. You should not have a disadvantage of that. But um, this, uh, yeah, that's how it is. It has always been like that. And uh, so uh, if you have a problem with it, uh, just let me know and then we'll see how we deal with it. Um, like I said, this has already, always been like that even before I took the course over when it was taught by a Dutch guy. And there are a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is, of course, also the textbook is in English, which actually makes, might it make easier for you to understand the content when also the lectures are given in English. And in general, a lot of literature that you find in computer science is in English because computer science is a field that is very much dominated by the uh, English-speaking population. So, uh, and if you get a, a degree from a university in computer science, you should also be able to read and understand the computer science, the common computer science literature, which, of course, is all mostly in English. Another reason why it is good also to have an English course at the bachelor level or a course taught in English at the bachelor level is that most of our cor courses in the master, especially the GMT master, are given in English because it's an international master. So it is also a good preparation for you because we hope of course, that most of you will then, after your bachelor, continue and uh, do a master here. Um, also, there are a couple of GMT students who uh, didn't do the bachelor here, and then they follow this course. And of course, since it's an international master, they might not speak Dutch. That's another reason why this course has traditionally always given in Dutch, uh, in English. And uh, of course, there's a final reason, which I usually like to illustrate with a little funny video clip. So let's just uh, switch here. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät, das Küstenwächter, das Gerät, das Gerät. Überlebens. Okay, so that uh, pretty much illustrates the level of English that I'm, uh, of Dutch that I'm able to speak. But as I said, I understand it reasonably well. So uh, you're welcome to uh, give it a try and uh, make me t uh, uh, improve my Dutch, or you can use it as an opportunity, opportunity to improve your English. Good. So the lectures will be yeah, I Pretty sure you all know that, at least the first one, which is a Tuesday. The second one is Thursdays at 1.15. Um, schedule is on the website. Usually we have two lectures per week. Textbook we are using uh, is also on the website, and I think you already know that uh, from the official Osiris website also, that uh, we're using Fundamentals of Computer Graphics, the third edition. We will not you, uh, do the whole book, but I will post the, the chapters of the book that are relevant for the lectures after the lecture together with the slides, so you can check those uh, chapters. And uh, it is a mandatory uh, book, so we said uh, a few years ago, people were actually complaining that we constantly uh, referred to the book and didn't um, make it mandatory. Um, the, uh, 
the book is mandatory, so I basically assume that you're reading all the chapters that I'm listing also on the website, and uh, they are, of course, then for the exam, we expect you to know all this content there, but uh, people, of course, uh, told me that they can also, they also pass the course uh, quite well without reading the textbook. It's more, I think, more a personal preference. Um, if you like learn better by listening to lectures or by reading textbooks, the best situation is, of course, if you do both. Good. Um, and if you have uh, access to the second edition, that should work right, uh, work well too. Uh, there are a few things that change to the third edition, but the second one works quite well too. Good. Um, another issue about the lectures, you already realized I'm having hang this cable hanging here from my neck. Um, I usually record these lectures, so I do the, record the audio and the screen captures and put them online afterwards. Um, usually within a day or two, for this one it might take a little longer because my laptop died last week, so I had to get a new one and I spent, had to spend the time that I planned to set the recordings up this weekend to install the software again on my new laptop. So it might take a little longer uh, this time, but then it's usually within a day or two the recordings are online. Um, but it's important that you are aware that this is not like an official service from the university. This is basically something I'm doing on my own because for various reasons I think this is beneficial for you and also the feedback that I got so far from the students in previous years was uh, overwhelmingly positive, which is why I think, uh, why I want to keep it up, but I'm basically doing this on my own initiative, uh, partly in my spare time. So it's, uh, it's, uh, I cannot guarantee it. And also, of course, there might at some points things go wrong. And then, of course, uh, we don't have recording from that uh, particular lecture. So uh, if you rely on that, just be sure that, uh, or don't com come complaining later if at some point we have to stop it or I, I don't have, or one of the recordings goes wrong. Uh, another issue is, of course, um, this is also something that uh, sometimes encourages people to skip lectures. Of course, if you skip a lecture, that's fine, but uh, make sure that you uh, then listen to the recordings very soon because this is a course with a lot of material and a lot of the stuff builds on each other, especially from the first part. So if you're getting too far behind at the, already at the very beginning, you will have a lot of problems in the end. And uh, I think a lot of the people who fail this course are not people to fail because the course, the content is too difficult, but because they're not keeping up with the content because it is just a lot of material in this course. Good. The lectures are complemented by tutorials and programming assignments. The tutorials will be basically exercise sheets, six of them that will come out um, every week, not every week, but roughly every week. And um, there is a group uh, uh, assignment on OSIRIS that is because OSIRIS only allows us to do the standard procedure and doesn't allow us to do any modifications to it, but we're doing things differently here, so uh, which is why the standard procedure is online, but we're basically ignoring it. The, uh, the, uh, the, the exercises, we basically expect you that you do them alone. There are supervised teaching assistant sessions, but we basically put the exercise sheet online usually two days before the teaching assistant uh, session. And then we expect you to look at them and then you can go to a teaching assistant session where a teaching assistant will be present and then you can ask them questions about the part that you didn't understand. Of course, you don't have to prepare. You can also just go there and do the exercises there. But it is most efficient for you if you look at the exercise before and then ask very concrete questions during those su uh, supervised sessions because the exercise sheet contains more data and more exercise than you can possibly do in two hours. So it is really the idea that you work on this on your own and then during the access to the teaching assistance sessions you can get um, support and help for the top parts that you didn't understand. Um, important thing, I, I made a comment last week on the website that the tutorials start today. That was of course a mistake because you need some content first from the from the lectures to be able to do the exercise sheet. So there are the, ex the, current, the first exercise sheet is online now and the first tutorial session is on Thursday. And the first tutorial exercise sheet has three parts. The first part you can do already now today. And the second and the third one then we are uh, stuff that we will talk about on Thursday. And then right afterwards is the first tutorial session. And then also next week there is a tutorial session. So there will be four tutorial sessions where teaching assistants are present do doing each week. Two of them are always in parallel, and both of them are directly, or all four are directly after the lectures. So after the lectures, there are two tutorials, and 
Like I said, we don't have a group assignment because it's basically up to you when and where you go. So it's pointless to make a group assignment. Um, what we basically say, and that worked quite well in recent years, that we basically say, just go to whatever time slot fits you best. Of course, the problem is at the beginning, everyone goes into one room, into one time slot. Um, so it is a little chaotic or at the beginning, but in the, in the end, uh, over a while, it usually evens out and it works quite well. So um, my recommendation is on Thursday, uh, if you want to do the tutorials, go to tutorials right after the lecture. If the room that you're into is full, check the other room. If there is still space there, then uh, stay there. If not, if both rooms are already blocked, then go to the tutorial on Tuesday, where the teaching assistants will discuss with you the very same exercise sheet. So there are always four opportunities, which with the number of students we have should work out quite well. We just have to be a little more flexible at the beginning. But in the long run, I think it is beneficial for you that you have this flexibility to go whatever tutorial fits you best instead of strictly assigning you to a time spot which doesn't fit your needs. Good. Uh, the same goes for the programming as, uh, pr uh, assignments or the programming labs. There will also be sessions where teaching assistants are present, but it's not like a lecture where you are supposed to be there and then they explain your stuff. It's basically you have to do, there will be three assignments. You have to do them on your own. And uh, there are, we have a room scheduled for that for the whole week. You can go there whenever you want. And during three or yeah, three time slots, there will be teaching assistant presence to help you and assist you with the work. Um, so there will be three programming assignments. The first one is online today because we're using some copyrighted material there. I got the, con the, uh, uh, the allowance from the author of the material to use it, but he asked me not to make it public. That's why there is uh, password protection, and I cannot say the password now because I'm recording it, but the uh, password is here on the blackboard. Should be easy to remember. Good, yeah. Speaking of easy, a warning, the first assignment, the uh, one of the problems with this course is that uh, you see there are a lot of people. I think we have usually around 200 registrations for this course. Uh, the problem is that there are a lot of people with very different levels here. Like I said, we already also have master uh, students here. We have students from the game program. We have uh, external students who have no computer science background here. Um, and what we say as a requirement is basically what you get in the bachelor in computer science in the programming, uh, in, the, in the first programming class in your first, uh, uh, in your first quarter. Now, uh, the, uh, the problem with that is, for example, for general computer science, they don't use XNA, what the game technology students do. So the first tutorial is basically just an introduction for everyone to catch up and come to the same level. So people who don't have experience, for example, with XNA should do this very carefully because this has all the basics and uh, the requirements that you need later. People who already have experience with XNA or with graphics program might consider this to be a joke. I'm pretty sure there are people here who will be done with this tutorial in half a day, maybe even less. But uh, the idea, so keep in mind, the next assignments will be much more difficult, which is also why we bring them online always before the deadline of the previous assignment. So the good people who are already done with it are encouraged to really start early on because like I said, the second and especially the third one are much more difficult and much more work. So you have to start in time. But of course, since we also have unexperienced people who might need more work, they uh, have a little longer time. So be careful with this and take the tutorial serious, even if it might seem very simple for you. And the people who think they have deficits, use this to put in some extra work, some extra effort to catch up and be then able, so you are able then later to do the more difficult assignments. Good. Yeah, and like I said, uh, we have one room reserved for this course for the whole week, which is PBL 175. Um, every now and then there are other people who see an empty room and then start giving a talk there or students who use this room because it's empty and their computers there. Um, if the room is uh, full and there are people who are not following this course, you have the right to ask them politely to leave and make room for you. If they don't leave, uh, let me know, then I will ask them politely to move and if they're still not moving I will ask them to move not politely um, so it usually works out you can go there every time you want and uh, 
Then we have this uh, three scheduled hours with teaching assistants. Um, currently, we have scheduled the two hours after the lecture, so in parallel to the tutorials. So that's why I also said if the tutorials are full, then you can also go to the practical room and work on your practicals and ask the teaching assistant there. And then the idea is basically that after one lecture, you go to the tutorial. After the other lecture, you go to the practical or the other way around. But as I said, you can also do the, the practicals at home. You don't have to go to the room, but this is just an opportunity for you to have some people there who are able to help you if you have questions. We also scheduled another time slot right before the lecture on Thursday because uh, at yeah, the room, it, there are 15 computers there and you're about 200 students, so you can do the math. It will. Uh, you have to be a little flexible, especially before the deadline, of course, then the rooms are very packed during those time slots. Um, but that is also why I say here changes may apply. So we will monitor this. And for example, if a lot of people are going Thursday morning, then we might assign a second teaching assistant there. Or if we say, see, a lot of people stay longer on Tuesdays, but not on Thursdays, then we might extend the hours on Tuesdays. So we want to be flexible in, in a way to best... Uh, to deal best with the needs that you have, but uh, yeah, that I, I don't know that yet. We will we'll observe that and then see it over time. And also before the deadline, then we will usually try to have more teaching assistants there or increase the hours so you have uh, more time then or uh, you are uh, have more opportunities to get questions answered. Um, another thing is also, of course, if you're doing your exercises at home, your programming's on your laptop, and you have a questions and you come to the teaching assistance, then it's a good idea to bring your laptop because then if, even if all the computers are blocked, you can still ask the teaching assistants questions. So uh, it's pretty much like the tutorials at the beginning. It's a little bit chaotic, but uh, in the long run, I think uh, having this flexibility serves you better and is in your best interest. Good, and uh, yeah, it's uh, the, the first time that a teaching assistant is there will be again this Thursday at 11, so before the lecture, but you can also go after the lecture because there is another time slot then where we actually have two teaching assistants there. And the tutorial sheet is, uh, the practical first assignment is online today. So uh, again, take notice of the password. Good, um, yeah. Uh, one important thing about the programming assignments is you have to do it in teams of two or three. That is also a tradition of this course that I took over from my predecessor. There are a couple of reasons for that. Of course, one thing is it's pure pragmatic. Um, if we have a course with 200 students and everyone turns in their own uh, assignment, it's just not feasible. We can just cannot handle it. But more importantly, of course, it is to teach you to work in a team which is also why this is a mandatory requirement. Like uh, I often get requests, yeah, um, I have bad experience with, with teamwork, so uh, can I do it alone? The answer is then, of course, is, uh, well, if you have bad experience, that's a good sign that you need more practice, so you're not allowed to do it alone. And then you get other questions saying, well, I have uh, already so much experience with teamwork, so I don't have to learn it. Can I do it alone? And the answer is, of course, if you have so much experience with teamwork, you shouldn't have problems doing it in a team, so no reason to do it alone. Of course, there are exceptions, um, but if you want that, let me know in advance. If you turn in the assignment alone without asking before, we have a penalty in your grade, because otherwise, yeah, people would just say, oh, I didn't know that, or I forgot that, and then... Uh, do it alone, which is not the purpose of it. Um, also, there are some special uh, 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 conditions for students from, fr from previous years. I specified them on the website. Be aware of them, those people who are here, who I see here with some familiar faces. There are some changes this year. We want to try something new. So uh, check the website. I don't want to repeat it here for everyone because for most people it will be boring. So uh, just check the website. Um, but make sure to check it today because there is a deadline involved, which is Thursday, not Tuesday, which I accidentally wrote yesterday, but I corrected it. Good. Um, there was a question here somewhere. Um, hmm. Normally, it should not happen because it makes the overall organization more difficult. But if it works out, then of course, yeah. We are not checking the, the groups uh, every time. Um, 
It is, of course, in that context important. Uh, there are, it always happens that people are dropping the course. Um, be careful when you have a team that uh, you realize that in time. So if, you dro if someone drops a course and you're alone suddenly, then of course, let me know. Then we try to find a new group for you to join or we give you the exception to work alone if you want that. Um, if uh, you are a group of three and one drops, then it sometimes also happens that like two days before the deadline or at the deadline, people come to me and say, well, our third team member said he will, going to do, will, he will be going to do this part and now he didn't deliver because he dropped the course. We haven't heard from him for two weeks. And uh, so can we uh, get a better grading or can we not have this part considered in our grading? And usually we have to be very strict with that because the point is the whole purpose of teaching you teamwork is that you are in contact with your team members. I mean, if you are not working, if you have a team member who doesn't work for two weeks and doesn't deliver and you only realize this after two weeks, that means you haven't been in contact with him for two weeks. You're not in contact with him about his progress. And that means you haven't really worked in your team. So I cannot punish you for the non-delivery of someone else, but I can punish you for not being, uh, not uh, working very well in a team. And that's what we unfortunately usually have to do. So be aware of that, that if you that some people might drop the course. And uh, so be always in contact with your team members, even if you split the work in a way that another team member does something that is not of the uh, interest or of relevance for the work, for the part that you are doing. Be aware of their progress and know if they can deliver and if they cannot deliver. If you contact us early in time, there is always a possibility to react. But the closer it is to the deadline, the more likely it is that I say, well, it's bad luck or uh, bad team management from you and not, uh, not the fault of the other guy necessarily. Good. Yeah, another organizational remark, uh, the practicals will be done on, uh, on the Windows. Uh, of course, it should also work with Windows 8, but that's the minimum specification. Visual Studio, XNA, and Game Studio. Um, yeah, there are always people who have a Mac or uh, who run Linux and are unhappy about that and complain about that. Um, this is a decision that was not made by me, but by the department when they made this focus on game technology because Windows and XNA is one of the most important platforms for game, uh, for game development. Um, and, uh, but of course, there is a, a, a reason for that or that there, is a, there are good arguments in general. I mean, you're studying computer science and uh, as a computer scientist, you should not just learn how to deal with one platform, but you should be able to understand more the concepts of it and then be able to apply that to different platforms. So it is actually a good idea to force you to learn and experience different platforms during your studies also. So um, even for Mac fans, it kind of uh, makes sense to every now and then also look into Windows and the development on Windows. Um, if you don't have that equipment at home, if you have a laptop or a computer at home, you're very welcome to do it there. Just make sure when you turn it in that it runs on the machines in the BBL because that's where the TAs will test it then for the grading. Also, um, if you don't have that equipment, that's the reason why we have to room the whole week because uh, the, the, the video card that we use, the, the graphics card, is not, not all computers have the graphics card that allows us to run this uh, XNA4 with the shader languages that we're using. But that's why I arranged this room and that's why I arranged it that we have it the whole week. So you can go there also doing uh, other days of the week and do your exercises there. So that should be enough opportunity for the people who don't have a Windows PC and don't want to buy one just for this course. Good. So, programming assignment has set three of them. The first one is just a tutorial, which is why it counts only 20% for your final grade. The other are more important, which, which is why they count 40% for your grade. And uh, the total programming grade counts one third for your uh, final uh, grade. Um, of course, obviously, there are a lot of specification at the beginning of the programming assignment, so I, I don't have to go into the detail here. But of course, reusing code is not allowed. Of course, there are exceptions for people who did the course last year. We might even in this case, uh, this situation, give the uh, except. We're considering giving the exception of uh, allowing a few people not to do the grade, uh, the programming assignments again, but have their grade from last year count. 
but uh, that will be decided on an individual basis on criteria that I uh, will then decide. So if you uh, are a previous year student, check the website and if you think uh, these criteria apply for you, then uh, get in touch with me. Good. Yeah, so just a summary of the schedule, like I said, lecture uh, two times a week afterwards four tutorials go to whatever uh, whichever you fits your personal needs best and whichever has enough space for you um, you are of course also welcome to go to both tutorials during uh, during the week um, we basically assume that you visit one tutorial per week but if you want to join both of them because you have more questions you're very welcome to do that if we have enough space which usually after two or three weeks, it, uh, it kind of works out. Practical sessions, like I said, are current. This is the current schedule. We will see depending on how, how uh, many people are there if we extend or shorten them. First tutorial and first practical is online now. First supervised session by teaching assistants start on Thursday. Good. Yeah, and then of course there are also exams which cover the tutorials and the lectures. One midterm exam, one final exam important for students who followed the course last year there is a change this year because of the schedule the midterm exam covers lectures one two three and not one to five and the final exam covers lectures seven to twelve the schedule this year is a little screwed up compared to normal years because we have two holidays on lecture days and also there is the Herr Kanzing week is this year before the midterm exam and not after the midterm exam which is why the schedule is a little uh different than in previous years Good. So exams definitely grades from previous years don't count. Um, exams are both mandatory. If you cannot attend one of them, let me know in time and then uh, usually you can do the retake instead. Um, and also, of course, always check the website for final information. And then the exam counts for the final grade twice as much as your programming assignments. Um, I said, I, like I already said, there is also a retake opportunity, but I refuse to talk about that now because I hope that you uh, will not need to take advantage of that. But if you're interested in it, uh, information is on the website. Speaking of the website, um, the website is online now. Put it online yesterday. Most importantly, okay, that doesn't work. Now it works. Um, here, there is a news item here. I usually post important last minute information and all kind of changes and important stuff on the website. And if I make a change somewhere in the website that is not just a typo or so, but an important change, then I put it also on the news at the front page. So you basically just have to look at the front page if there is some change, some important things. Uh, are newly posted there. So uh, this is basically also what I expect. I expect you to look at the website every now and then and always keep an eye on the first page, the news section, and then you can see all the changes and all the important announcements there. Good. So final organizational commands bef uh, comments before we go to the actual content. Just some final words. Um, experience from previous years this is a very work intensive course there is a lot of things to do you see it when you see the when you download the the exercise sheet and the uh, uh, the practicals there is a lot of stuff to read also the lectures especially at the beginning they go at a very fast pace because we have to get a lot of basic knowledge very soon to be able to do all this uh, cool and interesting graphic stuff um, make sure you don't get behind keep up with the content don't use the lecture recordings as an excuse to skip lectures and say, yeah, I can listen to that next week. Um, but use them in your advantage to really keep up. If you think you are behind, then take the recording and listen to them again to catch up with it. Stay on pace. Um, my experience is that most people who fail this course do not fail it because it's too difficult, but they fail it because it's just too much for them. So keep up with it. And it's too much for them because they're not keeping up with it in time. The other thing, I already mentioned this a little bit in relation to the programming. This is a very big course with about 200 students with a lot of different backgrounds. Um, so for example, we have people here who are really graphics, have done graphics programming for years and who are really experts in it. Um, but we also have people who are really uh, 
at a very beginner level of programming who have not much programming experience at all. Um, the same goes for the theory. For example, we have a, also a couple of mathematics students here who, for whom the first part of the lecture should pretty much be of, uh, a joke probably because it's basic linear algebra, which uh, they probably had in other lectures as well. Um, and we also have a lot of people who have no mathematic background at all. So uh, for them, the first part will be overwhelming and will be very difficult. So uh, <clears throat> well, this is also one of the reasons why in the tutorials and in the practicals, we give you so much flexibility that you are have the possibility to really say, OK, I'm really weak on the theory part. So I put in more effort. I go to two tutorials instead of one tutorial per week to catch up with that. Or if you say, well, the theory is pretty easy, but the programming, that's something I don't have experience with. So then you can spend more time in the practicals. But the point is, of course, it's your initiative. You have to take that. We are not going to say, OK, you're bad at the theory, so go to the practicals. You're bad in the programming, go to the programming course. So this is really something you have to get in your own initiative. And that's why I want to, to stretch it here. I don't want to scare anyone from this course. I just want to pinpoint the stuff that we uh, we realized in previous years when uh, the people who failed this course, why they failed this course. And it was basically because they had weakness in one of the other of these areas. And instead of working on those weaknesses and improving them, they did the other stuff because they liked that more. And that's, of course, not the good approach. Uh, quick comment to the mathematics students. Be careful with this. Um, uh, it happens very often, unfortunately, that they do extremely well in the midterm exam, have a 9 or even a 10, and then do very poor in the second exam because the second exam is more on algorithms. And that's the part where you it's not really difficult. It's not more difficult than the first part, but it's something where you just have to learn. Right? It says in the first part, the mathematics students, they don't need to put in a lot of them need, don't need to put in much effort so they just do it very quickly and very simple very easily and then they miss the part where they have to really sit down and do a little more uh, uh, background research so just a little warning be aware of that good so are there any questions about the organization like i said it's all also written on the website so make sure to to double check that and read that because i might have of course also forgotten something to say here good No, yeah, one question. Not today, Thursday it starts, yeah. So there are today and so far as the exercise sheets and the practical assignment is online. So you can download it now and then start working on it. But the supervised tutorials will be starting on Thursday. Good. Okay, then let's go to the interesting part, which is the actual content, which is computer graphics. So what is computer graphics? I copied the definition from the textbook, which says computer graphics describes any use of computers to create or manipulate images, which is, of course, a very general, very informal, very generic uh, definition or description of computer graphics. And of course, we all know computer graphics. But uh, it's important when we want to study to think about it. What does it really mean? What is it really that we want to study when we say we want to study computer graphics? And the key phrase here is, of course, create images. That is, we create an image that represents a virtual world or a real world or a view of something. So there is, of course, a distinction between uh, 2D and 3D graphics. Although here in the course, we will mostly focus on 3D graphics, which is then means we will focus on how to create images of virtual worlds or images that represent uh, scenes or objects from the real world from a specific view. And that is, of course, if you look at other, like often people say when they say, uh, think about computer graphics, they say, yeah, it's just dealing with images or all kinds of visuals on a computer. But from a computer science perspective, if you look at the different areas that we study in computer science, computer graphics, the most important characteristic is probably this creation of images in contrast to other areas of, com of computer science that also deal with images, most importantly, image processing and computer vision. Image processing takes an image and creates a different and modifies it to create a different image of it. A typical example for an application would, of course, be Photoshop, where you 
Now, uh, when you take one of the photos that you did and then you do some manipulation of it, I don't know, some filtering or you add, uh, you delete something and then you have a new image. That is the process of image processing where you take an existing image. So you do not create the image, but you modify an existing image. And then we have computer vision where you also take an image, but you analyze it. And a typical example would, of course, be the Kinect for game uh, interaction where you take an image of a person and then you analyze the, the image to identify the person and to identify its movements and to track its movements and then translate that to interaction. And then you have the, uh, and this is uh, uh, an example for computer vision. In both cases, we're dealing with images, but in both cases, these images are manipulated or analyzed, but they're not created. And that is then one of the major differences to computer graphics where we're thinking about the creation of images. And of course, there are also other fields in computer science that are closely related. For example, I already mentioned Kinect, which is about interaction. But of course, graphics, the, create, the images that we create are also important for interaction in terms of uh, the visual image, the visual feedback that we get during our interaction. Of course, all computers today have graphical user interfaces, but most of them are 2D with um, small 3D effects. But uh, we're interested here more in this course on like real 3D scenes and virtual environments where we can explore, for example, in a game, a 3D world. Good. Yeah, and of course, uh, uh, typical applications I already said, uh, uh, games is a good application of computer graphics where you often see it and uh, 3D graphics. Um, but also in the movie industry, there is hardly any movie today. Even movies with real actors use special effects and computer manipulations. Interfaces and human-computer interaction is, like I already said, also another important application area of graphics. So this now moves from the more leisure and entertainment applications to the more serious applications of graphics, which include information visualization, simulations like flight and car simulators, which are also, of course, uh, used for computer games, but also, uh, for, for example, for training, firefighter training with virtual reality simulations. Then construction, architecture, medical images, images these are all areas, serious, uh, more serious application areas of graphics. But of course, I think the huge majority of you are game technology students, so you're probably most interested in games or in more leisure applications. And one of them is, uh, of course, uh, animated movies. I have here just a few, uh, as a nice introduction, uh, a few images from the Pixar site although um, they actually redesigned their website, so those are outdated images. Uh, are, the, the URL is outdated. The images are no longer online, but they are a nice uh, illustration of their process, which is why I keep them in the, in the slides here. So the idea is, and of course, this is like marketing for them from their website, so this is not scientific, uh, but it's a nice uh, illustration. When they do a movie, they start with, of course, when you want to make a movie, you need to know what it's about, so you need to have an idea about a story and discuss that, then you need to write the story, you need to write the script, then the illustrators start to draw first images of that script, then you have actors who are uh, doing then the voices for the characters, and then you start with the editing, and then of course you're, uh, the artists really are drawing those characters that you move, that you use in the movies. And then you've seen that we have real actors also for an animated movie, but they are there to speak or to only to provide the voice input. But for the visuals, of course, they are not acting, but for the visuals, we have computer generated images. And that is then where the computer scientists come in. That is where computer graphic experts are starting then to create 3D models of those characters that are then acting in the movie in the place of the real actors in a real movie or a traditional movie. And of course, the computer scientists do not only make the characters, they also make the scenes where the movie take place. And when they have the scenes, they do not only create these models, like this wireframe model that you saw in a previous image, but they also have to put color on them. They have to consider the, the light. They have to consider the structure. For example, in this case, the one character has fur, so they have to model this fur and have to create this in a way that looks realistic. Of course, it's a it's a monster, it might not, uh, there, it's a question, what is a realistic look of that? But uh, it has fur, so we know how fur looks in real life. And that is something that you want to achieve also with the computer graphics. And then, of course, when you have that, you have to calculate all that. So instead of cameras that you have when you're shooting a real movie, you have computers here who are then not shooting, but calculating your movie. 
Good, and then of course some final touches and editing. So we see here there are certain things, uh, steps in steps in this process where we have computer scientists and computer graphics involved. And uh, like I said, these are like marketing or advertisement uh, images from Pixar, but they already use certain terminology that is common to computer graphics, which is modeling, shading, and animating. They split shading and lighting into two different uh, images, although, of course, technically, from a computer science perspective, lighting is part of the shading. So, uh, <clears throat> or even uh, we're actually talking about rendering and not shading. So from a computer science perspective, like I said, graphics is the process of creating an image. And the steps that are usually involved is first of all the modeling, which is the mathematical specification of the models that you have of the shape and the appearance of the shapes that you have, which is, for example, these grid models that I showed you or that you can yeah, you cannot see it with this uh, data projector light, but uh, in the slides on the left side, you see a grid model of this character. Then you have to specify the appearance, like the color of it, but then you have to do some extra work to get it really realistically looking like you have it on the right side. And that process, the creation of these so-called shaded image images is called rendering. That is basically then taking this abstract mathematical 3D description of your character and really creating a realistic looking 2D image out of it. 2D because of course your screen is 2D, although your description is a 3D description of the object. And this 2D image then uh, has to be um, uh, uh, in, in, in this process, you have to not only draw the, the object on the, on, the, on, the, on the screen, but you also have to consider, for example, uh, the texture of the object. If it has fur, it looks different than if it has a skin, uh, or if it has, uh, uh, if you have uh, an object that is made of wood or out of, uh, out of metal or of plastic, it looks different. It also reflects light different. Also, if the object moves, the influence of the light, of course, changes if the light source is fixed. So these are all the kind of things that you have to consider, and these are all summarized under this phrase, rendering. And then, of course, if you do a movie or if you make an interactive game, you also have some animation in it. But animation is not part, covered as part of this course. As part of this course, we will basically talk about the modeling, but only not really in the way of how we create more complex 3D models, but more in a way of what are the basic mathematics that we need for that. We will basically just talk about simple shapes like triangles and circles here. And then we'll talk a lot about the rendering, which is then how do we get these 3D models, these abstract descriptions onto the screen to create some realistic images out of it. And the animation is then covered if you stay here in a master course. Good. So uh, just give me uh, two more minutes, then we can make a nice, uh, nice break here. The uh, um, because that's, these are some, some final general comments about what we are going to do here in this course and how we are going to approach this. I already said we will do a lot of mathematics here. In general, if you are want to study computer science, there are, uh, sorry, computer graphics, there are different approaches to that. Like, for example, if you go to a bookstore and you look at the bookshelf where you find the book's introduction computer graphics, if you grab one of those books, there are basically three kind of types of books you can, you can, uh, you can get. Some of the books, if you grab them, if you open them, they look like a physics book. And that is because if we want to create a realistic image of our world, we need to have, of course, an understanding of our world. We need to know, for example, how light is reflected from objects in order to be able to calculate it and process it in a way that creates realistic images. And that is why a lot of people, or a lot of also courses, if you look at uh, iTunes U or, or online uh, course recordings from computer graphics, there are other courses that if you look at them, they look completely different or they start completely different than this course because they are looking at it from more the physics side. Then, of course, the other type of books when you get them is you open them and they look more like a mathematics book. And that is because 
if you know, if you have this physical understanding, you also need a way, of course, to describe it in a way that you can process them with the computer. And this is where the mathematics come into play. And if you focus it on that, or if you approach it from that way, then, of course, those books that you open look more like mathematic books. And if you already had a look into the book that we are using, at least in the first couple of chapters, then you will see that this is actually the approach that we are going to use. So there will be a lot of mathematics here. And then, of course, there are also the book, if you have the mathematics and you can describe everything, you also need to really put it into action. And this is then where the programming comes into play. And this is why if some of those books, if you open them, they look like programming books, which is because they are focusing more on the applications and the libraries that you use for this. And what we will do here, like I already said, we will focus, we will do a little bit of the physics and this is required, but mostly we'll focus on the mathematical background, on the theory, on the basics of it. And in a practical sense, you will hopefully then put it into action and work more on the application and the libraries. But this is important that you're aware of this, that the lecture and the practicals are kind of different in style. I'm focusing here very much on the concepts on a theoretical background. Um, and there are two reasons for that. One reason is that in general, it is uh, a good approach to learn also about the concepts and not just learn the programming languages, because if you know how to program, for example, in OpenGL graphics, and then at some point you need to switch to a different platform, but you, have, you didn't understand the concepts, it's sometimes very difficult to switch. But if you understand the concepts, it's more easier to switch between different platforms or between different uh, new versions of a platform, which is why it is sometimes better to learn more the concepts or to also have a theoretical understanding of the concept and not just learn, okay, this is the command I need to to uh, to type when I want to have a line drawn on the on the screen, but also to know what is actually going on when I'm when the computer draws this line on the screen. And this what is actually going on is what you will learn in the course, and hopefully the other stuff is what you will then do in the practicals. The second reason is, and that's more a philosophy of the university here, of the department here, that um, the department at some point decided not to have like separate mathematics course and a separate computer co computer science related course but to have them kind of combined which has the advantage of course if you teach the theory or more mathematic backgrounds uh, together with an application, it's very often easier to understand. Like when I was a student, we had it separate. We had a course on mathematics, on linear algebra, and I was in that course and I understood it reasonably well and I found it okay, but it was like, I was sitting there, I was like, yeah, okay, it's nice, but where do I need this and what it's important for? And then like two years later, I had another course and then suddenly I needed all that stuff and then I looked back into the material and I'm like, okay, now I understand it and now I know where to, how, to, how to use it and now I understand it much better that I can apply it because I see a need for it. Um, and that is something that we want to combine here now. The disadvantage of that is, of course, that um, very often when people learn the theory together with the application, they have problem apply, problems later applying the theory to other application areas, which is why at some point I will go also more into the mathematical details and more into the background of the theory than it is actually required for you to do, for example, computer graphics. But that is because this is the philosophy of this course that it is uh, intended or not just to teach you about computer graphics, but also about the basic ma of mathematics or the basics of linear, linear algebra. So the correct name of this course should actually be basic linear algebra and computer graphics and not just graphics. But uh, yeah, as far as I know, the system can only process a certain amount of letters for, uh, that they use for their administration. It actually happened to me once. I had a seminar with a long title, and then it just cut off the last part, which was the most important one. So I ended up having a lot of people in the, in the seminar who didn't, wasn't very interested in it at all. Anyway, so much about uh, administration things. Good. Yeah, so that is a good point for break, and it's also time for a break. Any questions? Good, then let's make a short break and uh, continue at uh, 10.